Johnny. Hey, Lou. You know, nothing fascinates us more than a good mystery story. Oh, yeah. And if that mystery story may be solved, we'll tell you about it on the very next Men Are So Smart. Well, hello there. Hi. Uh, hi. <laughs> Glad you could join us. I'm Lou Gallagher. I'm Corvette Ronnie. More than 45 years after a mysterious plane hijacker made off with 200 grand in ransom money, disappearing into the night sky, a publishing company believes it has finally identified the man who eluded authorities for so long. Yeah, at a news conference on Thursday, Michigan publisher Principia Media said the hijacker, known as D.B. Cooper, was former military paratrooper and intelligence operative Walter R. Recca. The company said uh, it worked with Recca's best friend, Carl Lauren, in compiling the evidence. Now, while the publisher did not disclose whether Recca was still alive, an obituary online lists a man with the identical name who lived in Oscata, Michigan, as having died in 2014 at the age of 80. Uh, an FBI sketch of D.B. Cooper and Walter Recca during a rare visit home in 1984 during his clandestine years working in the Middle East. Evidence including almost daily discussions over a 14-year period and three-plus hours of audio recordings featuring the Skyjacker was compiled by Recca's best friend. It was then analyzed by a certified fraud examiner and forensic linguist, the publisher said in a news release. The audio recordings created in 2008, including RECA, discussing skyjacking details that were not known to the public prior to the FBI's information release back in 2015. Uh, the publishing company worked with Lauren for the memoir D.B. Cooper and Me, a criminal, a spy, my best friend. Oh, that sounds great. I want to read it already. It's compelling. Vern Jones, CEO of Principia, talked uh, about the recordings that Lauren claimed were actual recordings of Recca speaking about the heist. Jones, a self-proclaimed skeptic at the start of the investigation, said that the evidence was overwhelming. D.B. Cooper and me, a criminal spy, my best friend, which claims Cooper was actually Walter Walt Recca from Michigan. We listened in Walter's own words. We heard him talk about his motivations for the hijacking. He talked about the jump itself, what happened in the plane, where he landed, how he got home, and most importantly, why he was never caught. Yeah, Jones played one of the audio, cl audio clips that described how Recca supposedly snuck the ransom note on the plane. Uh, now, where did you carry your note? Lauren can be heard asking. Inside pocket of my suit. Uh, he then asks, what about the note? Uh, was it, what, what the note was about, to which Recker re replies, I can't remember right there. This is a hijack, and I've got explosives. Hmm. And he gave that to a flight attendant, I would guess, to take to the captain of the plane. I'm, yeah, I'm guessing. That the rest be... of the audio clip describes the moments inside the plane when Recker was preparing to jump. In addition to the tapes, Jones said they reviewed letters, official documents, photos, and even a typed confession, all of which seemed to corroborate Lauren's theory that Walter Recca is the real D.B. Cooper. Hmm. Uh, Jones also seemed to hint that the dis uh, discrepancies between Principia's investigation and the FBI's inve investigation might not have been accidental. The hijacking, he said, was just the beginning of the story. Mm -hmm. A group of cold case detectives in the Pacific Northwest have allegedly discovered D.B. Cooper's parachute strap and possible location of the missing money. He detailed a supposed meeting, sorry, between Recca and two men in hard hats two months after the heist where he was asked by these two unknown men if he was prepared to go to prison. Recca was reportedly hired by them, though it is unclear if the two men Jones talked about were FBI agents. Dun-dun-dun! <laughs> Lauren himself spoke at the press conference and described Recca as a daredevil 
who always wanted to be in the CIA. Mm -hmm. uh, I always got the feeling that when he jumped with our team, the Michigan Parachute Team, it was a means of survival, not really for the thrill. Mm -hmm. He was looking for something far beyond that. A photo of the Michigan Parachute Team reunion in 2000 shows from left to right Carl Lauren, Walt Recca, Willard, Top Row, Hank Lucier, Bill Parker, Mark Mike Lucier, and Art Lucier in 1971 on the night before Thanksgiving. A man calling himself Dan Cooper, wearing a black tie and suit, boarded a Seattle-bound Boeing 727 in Oregon and then told a flight attendant uh, he had a bomb in his briefcase. He gave her a note demanding money. After the plane landed, he released 36 let's call them hostages, in exchange for $200,000 in ransom and parachutes. The ransom was paid in $20 bills. That's a lot of money. Yeah, that's a lot of $20 bills. Yep. Uh, the hijacker then ordered the plane to fly to Mexico, but near the Washington-Oregon border, he jumped and was never seen or heard from again. After the skyjacking, Wrecker later, excuse me, Recca later became a high-level uh, covert intelligence operative according to the publishing company. Recca possessed skills to survive jumping out of the plane because he was on the Michigan parachute team, according to the publisher. He attended the team reunion in 2000 and was pictured in the photo we mentioned earlier. Uh, despite the claims of the publishing company, the FBI has never ruled out the possibility that the hijacker was killed in the jump, which is my theory, by the way, Okay. which took place during a rainstorm at night over rough wooded terrain Hijackers' clothing and footwear were also unsuitable for a rough landing. Over the years, the most lasting image of Cooper, who became somewhat of a legend, may be the two sketches the FBI released of the suspect. Many investigators have come forward with their theories for who the infamous hijacker may be. Earlier this year, the leader of the private investigative team, who had spent years trying to crack the D.B. Cooper hijacking case, claimed... He believes the mysterious criminal was a CIA operative whose identity has been covered up by federal agents. Mm. Mm. And so it goes on. Yep. Uh, Thomas Colbert, a documentary filmmaker who helped put together the 40-member team, said in January his team made the connection from work a codebreaker uncovered in each of five letters allegedly sent by Cooper. Sent last January, the February, excuse me, the FBI has released more than 3,000 documents to Colbert's team investigating the hijacking. The FBI said in court papers that it has more than 71,000 documents that may be responsive to Colbert's lawsuit. Now, here's the thing. We're both old enough to remember this. I do remember it. In 1971. Yep. I remember hearing this story at a Little League baseball game, I think it was. I was about 12 years old. I remember we talked about it. I probably was in 7th and 8th or 8th grade. Uh, and we actually talked about it in class a little bit. Uh, prior to this D.B. Cooper thing, there had been a couple of hijackings earlier. I think that kind of, and you can't quote me on this, but I, I think hijackings first began in, in the late 60s, like, Maybe 67 or 68. Yeah. And normally it was uh, uh, foreigners right. who would hijack um, planes of all sorts, not just American ones, and then take the passengers as hostages and uh, demand money and to be flown to other countries. Right. Very similar to this. Yeah. But none of them jumped out of the plane. And none of them got away with it. No. <laughs> so maybe that's what D.B. Cooper if that's, in fact, his real name, uh, jumped out because he knew that no one else had succeeded. Right. And so that was his different M.O. Got to have a different escape route if none of the other ways have worked previously. It's, yeah, it's like that thing about they say about banging your head against a wall and expecting a different right. outcome, right. you know? Yeah. So maybe that's what he thought. Now, this is where it gets a little dicey. It was a stormy night. Right. I'm not writing a mystery here. <clears throat> it was a stormy night, and it was raining very hard. And according to uh, findings, he exited that plane with the parachute in a very 
rocky, hilly, um, dangerous area of terrain. Well, the other thing to consider is parachuting back then, the parachutes of those days are nothing like the parachutes of today. They were canopies uh, only. They weren't these you know, flying wings like the, the guys use now that can be, you know, directed and, and driven very easily. They were subject to the winds. Yeah. You landed wherever the parachute wanted to land. Mm -hmm. So um, my theory has always been that he didn't make it. Somebody may have stumbled across some money at some point and never reported it, never reported it, right. or it could just be in a, a dense part of jungle, you know, uh, forest yet to be found. Land. Yeah, yet to be found. Mm -hmm. The next Fen's treasure, right yeah. there. <laughs> and check out some of our Fen treasure episodes. You'll see them pop up here uh, above my head. So, uh, Ronnie, you know what? I always root for the underdog, <laughs> and being the rebel <laughs> that I've been labeled as, I kind of root for DB Cooper to have gotten away and escaped and spent the let well. $200,000 back in 1971 was a lot of money. I mean, that's almost a quarter of a million. Yeah. And back then, you know, that was like probably that's, two million. That's retirement money. That's, I would think. You could put $200,000 in the bank and live off it the rest of your life back back then. And pretty much do whatever you want with the rest of your life, provided yeah. you fly uh, literally, pardon the pun, under the radar. Yeah. I mean, interest rates were high. You could put it in the bank and you could... Yeah. You literally could make enough money on interest. Oh, and imagine the killing you could make them buying a house or two. Oh, yeah. Right? Oh, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So there you go. D.B. Cooper. Mm. I like to believe he got away with it. You know, no one got hurt. That's true. So. Um, I'll give him that. I mean, I'm not condoning what he did. I mean, it's against the law. I understand. You'll go to prison for the rest of your life. <laughs> yeah. But, you know. If they catch you. If they catch you. You're only guilty if they catch you. <laughs> All right, that'll wrap up this episode of Men Are So Smart. The D.B. Cooper mystery continues. Or have we found the person who actually was D.B. Cooper? Information on both of us you'll find below. And uh, we would love to hear your comments or theories on what you think happened. Oh, yeah. oh sure. And you know what? Ronnie and I respond to them rather quickly, too. Oh, yeah. So uh, when you send us a message, a comment, whatever it might be, We'll get back to you, promise. Um, and you won't have to wait long, the next available moment. Look who that is. That's D.B. Cooper right there. Yeah. Looks like Greg Everly. It does a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, please subscribe to our channel. We would appreciate it. We see the numbers rolling in, and they are very good. Thank you very much for subscribing to the channel. Uh, if you would, the Gallagher Entertainment Network. Tell your friends about it. Uh, this is a show we do a couple times a week, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And it's a show for men done by men for you. We'll see you on the next Men Are So Smart. Bye-bye. What's kind of crazy is Tom Sullivan played it and then he played it 10 minutes later and I heard very distinctly one way then very distinctly the other so I don't know how really to break it to you other than to tell you this you need to see some because <laughs> there's, there's inconsistencies <laughs> there's some wrong you're, you're probably not regular well I am pretty Are much you regular pretty much 7 a.m. okay yeah tell, you're, tell everyone so pretty much at 7 a.m., the uh, Brown Snake Special leaves from Colinsville to Porcelain City. I see. Yeah. And you better be on it. Yes. <laughs> yeah. You know, occasionally it might be five or ten minutes late if there's some uh -huh. kind of a mix-up. But I see. Yeah. It, it runs pretty much right at now, 7 a.m. do you take calls when this is going on uh, or texts? No. 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 Are you on Facebook while you're pooping? Uh, no. No? No. I'm just in there by yourself, yeah, man. I, I like to get, I like to concentrate and just, I'm not one of those people that hovers over the 
you know, the toilet and reads a magazine or anything. Yeah, I'm not either. I'm like three minutes in and out. And what's that thing about lighting a match? That smells worse than the... Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. All right. Okay. Here we go. Here. Uh, you got a little battery warning. Mm -hmm.